Welcome to Progress Not Perfection. We are finally on the air. My name is Ella and I will be your host throughout this entire journey. Let me tell you a little bit about Progress Not Perfection. I want to glorify recovery. And when you think of recovery, some of you might say, what is that? Recovery is the other side to addiction. And addiction is a pandemic. It is everywhere. And right here in Knox County, it's a really big problem. But I don't want to make you sad. I don't want to speak about anything that's, you know, going to want to make you change the channel. I want to glorify the success. We do recover. I have been interviewing multiple drug addicts. Not only have I been interviewing multiple drug addicts, I have been interviewing mothers, fathers, children, grandparents, couples, husbands, wives, anyone that has a story or opinion about addiction. Recovering drug addicts, they, when I interview them, they come on the show and they share their story. What led them to addiction, what kept them in addiction, and how they overcame it and what they're doing today. And the stories are absolutely beautiful. I am so proud of every recovery story. It is absolutely beautiful. This episode tonight is very near and dear to my heart. It is with a very special person. So, that being said, let's get to it. Hello, thank you for tuning in to Progress Not Perfection. My name is Della and I'm a recovering drug addict. Most of you want to change the channel once you heard the term drug addict, but you're missing the key word there, recovering. I am a recovering drug addict. Right now, I'm standing in front of Knox County Courthouse where unfortunately most addicts end up. And it's a very sad thing. Addiction takes you through a lot of crime, overdose, a lot of pain, and a lot of jail time. But today, I'm interviewing a man that goes above and beyond his day job. During the day, he is known as Judge Cerny of General Sessions Court. But on Wednesday, he is with Knox County Recovery Court and Knox County Veterans Treatment Court. I am proud to say that I was in the program and I graduated. And the staff and the judge in Knox County Recovery Court and Knox County Veterans Treatment Court helped me change my life. They gave me the tools I need to continue my recovery. So. Further ado, let's go in and see what Judge Cerny has to say himself. We are officially inside the courthouse, and I am here with Honorable Judge Chuck Cerny. Mm -hmm. It's so nice of you to uh, visit with me. Thank you for. Thank you for having me. Are Absolutely. you ready to start this interview? I am ready. Interview is in session. You heard that. Well, I just want to say it's such an honor, your honor. Let's get to know you a little bit. Where are you from originally? I grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana. Graduated from Purdue University for undergraduate. And then uh, because I had always loved visiting the South, uh, when my family came here for vacations, I uh, decided that my opportunity to attend uh, University of Tennessee's law school would be the opportunity I took advantage of. So. Um, just discovered I loved living here and uh, loved the people, and so I decided to stay. Knoxville is a great place to live. Absolutely. I was born and raised here, and I absolutely love it here. Yeah, I completely agree. I had a brief period of time. Uh, my first job after law school was in Chattanooga, and then uh, uh, came back to be an assistant DA at the DA's office here in Knox County. Uh, and then got elected in 98, so oh. that, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's my history. That's the history. I like it. So during the day, you are a judge in mm -hmm. General Sessions Division 1, correct? Yes, ma'am. But every Wednesday, he is the judge for Knox County Recovery Court and Knox County Veterans Treatment Court. 
and that is a very important program and as I said in the beginning of the show I was honored to be a part of that program it completely changed my life and I am proud to say I'm over two years clean and it has a lot to do with your program well, I'm so proud of you. You worked hard and you did a beautiful job in the program. And uh, thank you for your positive uh, comments about Knox County's Recovery Court. Um, it's a, it's a problem-solving court where we address uh, a kind of different aspect about criminal justice system involvement. As you know, sometimes there's, there's folks who are basically nice folks, but uh, they're getting criminal justice system involved as a direct result of addiction issues and recovery court can help get to the underlying root cause uh, and help folks not be criminal justice system involved again and uh, help them with recovery like your situation yeah. it's it's a it's it's a beautiful program so what makes you so passionate about helping fellow drug addicts from what I understand you do this you're not compensated for doing this at all. So, um, I apologize if this is personal. Have you experienced addiction yourself or anyone close to you? I think if I were candid with you, I would probably have to admit that I have a, an addictive personality. I don't have um, a, a, I want to approach this response humbly uh, with the understanding that uh, all human beings are vulnerable in, in a lot of ways. I admit to you that I have an, uh, an addictive personality, but I would say to you that uh, my addictions are relatively benign. I'm, I admit that I love exercise, and even though I'm getting to be a little bit older, I still you know, find myself uh, working out an awful lot, and I am trying to uh, become competitive, uh, trying to race a bike. But uh, you know, if you if you want to actually ride a, a a bike fast and be competitive, uh, you have to you probably need to spend a minimum of um, about 12 hours a week actually pedaling. So. Wow. You know, if uh, if I get in enough workouts, it's almost like a part-time job. So, um, and uh, but with respect to exposure to the addiction, addiction in the traditional sense, I've had folks I was close to uh, who have uh, uh, manifested addiction, uh, and uh, uh, they're either uh, obviously you can have folks who who, who function from day to day, but addiction is still um, causing problems of one kind or another. And then of course some folks uh, uh, get to the point where they're so addicted to some substances that they're not functioning well. And of course some folks get criminal justice system involved as a result of addiction issues. Uh, um, you know, uh, obtaining addictive substances is something that you have to support somehow. Uh, financially, um, and so there's a lot of different ways to get involved in the criminal justice system when you're motivated by uh, profound addiction. I think I'll qualify on all that. I was a functioning drug addict. I resorted to criminal activity, dealing drugs, and you know when it becomes when it takes you over, there's nothing that you will not do, and you'll do it to anybody. And that's very unfortunate. Have you noticed an increase in drug offenses, let's say, in the past five years? So, sometimes uh, when you're performing the function of judge, um, it's a little like swimming. And then if somebody asks you to count the molecules of water that pass by it as you're swimming, <laughs> Um, it, it would be hard to tell if there's more molecules or not in a way, but uh, um, we stay very busy. And it, if I could just use a kind of um, like anecdotal observation, just, just observing it, it seems like we have quite a few more. And it does seem like we have quite a bit more in terms of um, 
folks who are um, arrested or stopped or, or um, have contact with law enforcement and they are found to have large quantities of uh, some of the drugs that are out there on the street and uh, some other indi indicators um, that law enforcement is finding folks who are engaged in the, in the business. There is in fact a market. There's a marketplace out there. There's supply, there's demand just like any other economic concept. It, it, it's a, it's a, um, a whole other economy. So I, I would suggest to you that uh, there's enough demand that there's people trying to get into the business and there's enough folks who are motivated to be in the business and of, uh, of marketing illegal drugs. Well, to admit to you, I, I thought I was <coughs> pretty on top. I, I thought I was on top. I built my pyramid, and, but everybody falls. And my arrest um, was a blessing. But once I got into a program, um, I guess I completely surrendered. And when I came out, I came to recovery court and just yeah. said, what do I got to do? You know, I cannot live like this anymore. And I really meant it. Every other time I had gotten out of jail or anything, I was doing it for family, friends, whatever reason, and it, it just never worked. But that last time, um, I have to say I'm so grateful for you. When I first got out of jail, um, you were celebrating your 10-year anniversary as recovery court judge, and I had to sign a card. and. If you don't mind, I would love to show a couple of pictures. Of from course, that, from that. I certainly wouldn't mind. Absolutely. But let, let's let's just <clears throat> take a second here and make sure that your viewers understand something that I really think is very important. Um, there are folks in the criminal justice system who are mean-spirited, uh, violent, uh, evil. They do unkind things to people. Um, and uh, they probably need the, the, what the criminal justice system has to offer in the form of incarceration if they're in fact convicted. But you're an example of a person who, who's a genuinely decent person inside. You're a genuinely kind, good person. And I remember my interaction with you in the form of uh, you know, our dockets and, and uh, contact that we had in uh, uh, the context of, we'll talk about this, certainly uh, uh, the milestone celebrations, the, uh, the times that we got together, uh, all of the participants and all of the staff uh, to celebrate how well things were going for many of our participants. And uh, it was always uh, a joy to see you succeed. And it was always a joy to work with you. So um, I think your viewers should know that uh, there are some mean people who need to need to get in jail in uh, in the world uh, in Knox County. But there are some nice folks who get involved in the criminal justice system, and it's uh, uh, you know, of course, there are decisions that they've made, but we we can we can help folks not come back. You know, there is hope for people to make positive changes, and you're an obvious example of that. I'm so proud of you. Thank you so much. I think you are. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Let's take a, a brief moment, and I'd like to show you a couple of pictures of me and Judge Cerny of when I graduated, a couple of pictures of Milestone, and which we will explain what a milestone is, and we'll be right back. So when the docket comes up every Wednesday, mm -hmm. how do you know what each participant needs? How do you judge them individually? That's a great question. And um, I, I know that your viewers would like to know a little bit about the, the, the distinctions between 
uh, regular criminal justice process and a recovery court or a problem solving court. Before a participant even enters recovery court, they have to, uh, of course, become criminal justice system involved, and, and that's a that's that's a nice way of saying get arrested, of course. Um, and and then at that point they choose uh, either through the negotiations of their lawyer, uh, who speaks with the the DA or or uh, whatever other means that, that person gets referred to recovery court. And then recovery court and the, the presiding judge uh, who refers the, the person, uh, they make a decision about whether or not the person would have that opportunity if they're a good candidate. Because remember, there's you know there's certain things in the statute that help control, uh, you know, persons uh, who are on the sex offender registry, for example, are not allowed to become participants. Um, and then, uh, you know, folks who are, who have violent offenses on the record, they're not able to be participants. The statute excludes that. So once someone is voluntarily involved in the program, once they say, yes, I'd like to take a shot at this, then they start interacting with the staff. Now, the staff includes case management, probation officers, it includes uh, a prosecutor who represents the interests of the state and the, and the safety of the community. That involves also uh, a defense lawyer who uh, spends their extra time to try and help our participants get through this process. And uh, of course there's treatment providers and representatives of halfway houses. Um, and uh, the halfway houses provide a certain amount of support and treatment. The, uh, the treatment providers would be Helen Ross McNabb or Cherokee Health or sometimes private uh, treatment providers who are providing addiction treatment, helping folks with their recovery. And then of course sometimes we have, uh, we have some folks in the 12-step programs which we have great respect for and we really appreciate those folks. Uh, um, but uh, each docket, before we actually have the docket, I get a consultation, an opportunity to uh, meet with the staff, and the staff is comprised of all these folks I've mentioned. Uh, they all have interaction with the participants in one uh, form or another, to one degree or another. And as a result, they have the opportunity to tell me what the, the participants been doing, how, how well they've been doing, whether or not they've been faithful to appear at their uh, group intensive outpatient treatment, for example, or whether or not they successfully graduated from inpatient treatment, or whether or not they're attending 12-step meetings faithfully, and of course, whether or not they test positive for any drug that uh, is prohibited by law, of course, and some drugs that are not prohibited by law, some drugs that are uh, legal. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that uh, is legal for adults to have it and use it, but in this context, it's not appropriate for our participants, you know, and a good example is alcohol. So, you know, I have the opportunity to meet with professionals, folks who have, uh, you know, all the letters behind their name, uh, licensed uh, clinical social workers and uh, treatment providers, sometimes even medical doctors who uh, provide medically assisted treatment. And so I get a recommendation. And uh, between all of the members of the staff and myself, we decide um, what should be the response to how well someone has done for the past week or so. And remember also, and you recall it very well, I'm sure, we have weekly dockets. You know, it's not as if something gets uh, considered on a, on a list of things we have to do today, which is basically what a docket is, and then we, we look at that participant's situation and then we postpone the case for three months or something. You know, regular, consistent contact with the judge uh, and with these treatment providers and case managers and social workers, all of those things contribute to um, an opportunity for the participant to make beneficial changes in their behavior. And that's, that's a big deal. And, and you know, what we've discovered, uh, recovery courts and problem-solving courts have been in existence for, um, I'm going to have to guess, but let's, let's ballpark it at about 30 years. 
And so, and there is a national association. There's a Tennessee Association of Recovery Court Professionals. I'm on the board of the Tennessee Association of Recovery Court Professionals. Did not know that. I, I need to need to be a little more active. And this uh, this coming 2023, I'm gonna be a more positive contributor. Be loud and proud about it. Uh, yes, well, absolutely. I'm, I am proud of the quality education opportunities uh, that they provide for all of the recovery courts in Tennessee and all of the professionals who work in that context. I, I, we, we have national level speakers coming all the time and uh, at our conference each year. They're, they're, and we've got a great director, uh, the Tennessee Association of Recovery Court Professionals. She's, uh, she's a rock star. Candidly, we also have, a, a, in this state, we have a, the Tennessee um, Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services under Governor Lee. Uh, since we've been under the, that department, we were moved from the Office of Criminal Justice Programs. They've just done a really great job of supporting all the recovery courts, helping us uh, maintain best practices so that we really, really provide good services. And as a result, you know, you, you can really point to a lot of success stories like yourself. You can point to a lot of lives that are changed. A lot of uh, folks who are no longer criminal justice system involved. From the standpoint of the community, from the standpoint of your viewers who may never have experienced addiction or the only involvement with the criminal justice process they've ever had is, you know, having a lead foot in a school zone or something like that and five miles an hour over the speed limit, you can take heart also that your community is safer when folks don't re-offend. <coughs> and uh, re-offending is one of the things that we help a lot of folks with. Uh, our graduates don't come back through the criminal justice process very often. We, we had one or two, not very often. And I'm really proud of that, so, you know. Well, I think that's because the program has so many different resources and options, and you do, and the staff, they do everything they can to make sure that we don't go to jail. Absolutely. They, they offer so many things. Is there anything that you wish that you could offer that isn't being offered? It, it's funny you'd say that because um, deep in my heart, if uh, if I were to win the lottery, I'd probably um, donate whatever it took to find. Uh, uh, maybe a hotel or something that's on the bus line that is not being uh, uh, used extensively for its original purpose but would provide an opportunity for uh, folks to have a, a home life or home environment uh, that would be conducive to recovery and where there would be support available and where um, um, Clearly, I'd like to have um, you know law enforcement available. I'd like to have uh, staff uh, uh, easily available in that context. But if I could pro provide uh, a living situation, you know, through a, a charitable organization that, that's organized correctly and legally, right. and just donate it, um, you know, with a 501c3, you know, the the, the um, appropriate federal law that regards uh, uh, nonprofit organizations if if, um, if money were no object and I had infinite resources or if I had access to infinite resources uh, that's uh, something I wish we could provide beautiful I, um, I totally uh, agree with you um, so how do you feel about the fact that an addict basically has to have like money, insurance, or a grant to receive help. You know, what could we do as a community to better help the addict who wants and seeks the help but has no means to do so? Does that follow with it's, what you just said? That is, a, that is a very tough question because if you ask it that way, you're, you're, you're basically referring to all those folks who suffer from addiction and not necessarily just criminal justice system involved folks. And uh, um, in, I certainly wouldn't wish on any human being uh, that they 
get arrested for something uh, that's not necessarily um, the best way to find yourself in a treatment situation or, or beginning the road to recovery from addiction. It isn't the best. Um, but of course, if you don't have insurance, if you don't have uh, uh, an opportunity to find a treatment provider uh, through these other means, that makes it tough. Um, I think that, that to some extent there would be some usefulness in uh, um, either charitable organizations, even some of the faith, uh, faith community, uh, providing resources for this kind of thing um, for individuals who are suffering in this way. Uh, I don't think that it's a, a poor investment of tax dollars to invest in human beings because um, I earnestly believe that, that all human beings have infinite worth. And even folks who have made mistakes, even folks who've been through trauma and they're trying to self-medicate uh, to forget the trauma they've experienced, uh, even folks who head down the path of addiction and, and, uh, and perhaps become, uh, you know, perhaps get arrested or become criminal justice system involved, those, those folks uh, still have um, the value that's associated with simply being a human being. And, and, um, I don't, I don't think that that would be a bad investment of um, taxpayer dollars if we were to support um, addiction treatment opportunities for folks who are indigent who can't pay. I, I think that that would be a wise thing. This is in complete personal opinion, but what is your opinion about the needle exchange? Do you consider that a recipe for disaster, or do you consider that a positive thing? You know, um, there are a lot of different situations where we think we're providing some kind of disincentive uh, to make it tougher for someone to do something that either uh, endangers the community or endangers themselves. And, I, and I'm certain that there are some folks who would use the reasoning that uh, not having needles available uh, would make it more difficult to use drugs that have to be injected. But remember, there's an awful lot of hepatitis out there. Of course, uh, at some level, I think there has been some research and some uh, ground gained with respect to treating and even preventing AIDS, but uh, AIDS is still out there. Um, uh, the, We've just experienced a, a coronavirus pandemic, and, and that's not really over. And of course, that's transmitted a different way. But uh, the transmission of disease is something we can prevent. And so uh, the terminology needle exchange, as I understand it, what that really means is for folks who request access, there's access to needles that have not been used, that have not been contaminated, that are not likely to have diseases, uh, uh, such that disease would be transmitted. And remember, all of these diseases can be transmitted from addict to addict through used needles, but addicts are in our community. Folks who are using are in our community. If we provide a needle exchange, it's going to reduce disease uh, for even non-addicts and non-criminal justice system involved folks. Because remember, these diseases that are communicated in this way can be communicated other ways, many of them. And uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, what you're referring to, providing needles, is actually a way of reducing disease. It doesn't, it doesn't reduce drug use, obviously, but reducing disease is a kind, compassionate, decent, reasonable thing to do, and it's, it's something that positively affects all of us. Right. So, um, uh, Pros maybe and that's, cons to it. well, and maybe that's just a long-winded way of saying I think that it's probably a good idea. I think we have to concede, Let, let's admit to ourselves that human beings are driven by uh, a variety of uh, motivators, um, many, of what, many of which are, are related to pleasure and pain. 
And um, I haven't met the first, the first little kid that when they're 10 years old, you ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they respond, I want to be a drug addicted felon. I want to have a felony on my record. I want to have multiple felonies on my record. And I want to be profoundly addicted to drugs such that when I'm uh, having that urge to use my drug of choice, I am willing to hurt other people, uh, steal their money, steal them from my own family uh, to get my drug of choice. I haven't met the first little kid who says, that's the way I want to be when I grow up. What I have experienced is when folks are in the midst of active addiction, truly deal with what's going on in their lives and what has happened in their history, their personal history. What I discover is uh, their use of drugs is consistently related to trying to anesthetize or self-medicate because they have experienced trauma. That's much more prevalent than someone who's just uh, reckless about their conduct and uh, simply is uh, pleasure seeking for no other purpose. Uh, I don't find that to be the case. What I do find is hurting people who want to uh, dull pain uh, or, or, or try to forget about pain for a short period of time. And uh, we would be uh, truly uh, as a society lacking in compassion and I think that that's an evil thing I think that's a bad thing if we insisted that that um, every single incident of um, addiction or every single person who's uh, addicted uh, is simply guilty of some moral inequity or moral turpitude or just moral failing. That's, that's just uh, not a reasonable way to approach this. It's not what I've observed. I'm sorry to get emotional, but <clears throat> when you said the thing about the 10 year old, they don't want to grow up and be a drug addict, you know, uh, I started using when I was nine years old and I don't really recall ever wanting to grow up and be anything because drugs is all I knew. So I'm sorry to get emotional. Um, we'll take a little break. I want to go ahead and say that was not staged. Those were real tears. When he began to speak about a 10 year old, when they dream about growing up, what they want to be, they don't want to be a drug addicted felon. And that's very true. And when we took that brief intermission, we had a 10, 15 minute conversation and I had to explain to Judge Cerny why I became so emotional. And since I shared it with him, I can share it with you. I never really had a dream when I was a child. Um, my childhood was taken away from me due to sexual abuse at a very early age. So I had no childhood. And to cope with what was going on during that time, that's when I began to use drugs. I began using drugs when I was nine years old. So I never got to have that dream. And I guess it just took me to a place in my past where I don't ever recall wanting to be anything when I grow up. I was so clouded by drugs that I never wanted to be anything because drugs is all I've ever known. So that was not staged whatsoever. Let's get back to it. I apologize for that, folks. Let's get on to some more positive milestones here at Knox County Recovery Court and Veterans Treatment Court. I love milestones. Tell us a little bit about the milestones. Well, milestones is the name that we use uh, to describe uh, the little get-together. Uh, you could say party or, or uh, potluck dinner or uh, however you want to describe it. We've had picnics, uh, of course, we've, we've uh, had this at uh, local parks. But the milestone celebration is where we celebrate uh, important uh, milestones or, or uh, accomplishments or 
wonderful things that our participants have done, including graduating, obviously. Um, and this program, of course, Recovery Court and Veterans Treatment Court, is a five-phase program. And uh, so uh, we celebrate when folks face up. We celebrate when uh, uh, folks uh, get great new jobs. We celebrate folks having uh, significant clean time. Uh, there's a lot of wonderful things that are happening. And, uh, you know, the research has shown uh, that human beings are very, very motivated by positive reinforcement. And, and that's why we uh, celebrate milestones as a kind of incentive when folks are doing well. We do have to, as you know, uh, and you, you've seen other participants, I, I don't remember you having a sanction. But no, sanction, I was never sanctioned. I faced up once. on every mark. Once uh, one of the staff members told me, he gave me a piece of paper and he said, you got to do this for every phase, I was, I was on it. I faced well, up. Um, but you had the opportunity to see other participants who, who did have some behaviors that were sanctionable behaviors, and, and we had reasonable sanctions, uh, but they were timely. Um, and what I mean by that is, uh, if someone has a behavior that you want to discourage, like for example, they um, have a falling out with staff, uh, that's, that's them being impatient or, or irritable or whatever, or if, you know, of course, if someone tests positive or uses, or um, if, uh, heaven forbid that someone would reoffend. but every now and then uh, some of our folks don't have driver's licenses and valid status and so they get impatient, they have access to a car and so they drive. That's a violation of the law, you know, so we, we, have, um, we have the ability because we're having weekly dockets to discover that that's occurred and have a, a response that's way closer to almost immediate. And then when you have the immediate response and you sanction adverse behaviors um, and incentivize positive behaviors, uh, you can actually affect behavior change. You can help people become a little closer to normal, as normal as any of us are, right? I agree with that. You know, when I first started going to the milestones and, you know, who faces up from one to two, two to three, so on and so forth, um, I remember I was so embarrassed, I had to walk up there and I still have all my little medallions and at first I, I was just embarrassed, like why are we doing this? But I think it was right around phase three, it was, I started to feel, I did this, you know, he is the judge, the staff, they gave me suggestions, I was in other programs, but I achieved this. And so it felt, I don't know the word, just amazing just to go up there and say that I phased up and I did this. It, you know, um, so it, it, there's, there's a real sweet spot if you want to use that terminology. Sometimes folks get a little too proud of themselves and, and that's something that we don't really admire. Uh, we don't think that that's an admirable trait. Uh, if you're a little too ate up with yourself. But you know, our participants, first of all, I'm proud of them. And I tell them so. But you remember, um, and I continue to tell our participants, if you feel proud of yourself, that's a good feeling. And I want you to feel proud of yourself. I want you to feel like you have some worth and that you've done some good things that deserve recognition and that uh, you have a right to be proud of yourself. And, and uh, that's, that's, that also can be a very uh, uh, important motivator because when folks start kind of getting on a roll, when they start seeing, hey, yeah, I can do this. I can recover. There is, there is hope. Uh, there is an opportunity to never be criminal justice system involved again, but still be productive and still find a way to, uh, you know, get my bills paid. And, and you remember, we had a lot, of, uh, a lot of participants who were separated from their families, maybe even separated from children. 
Um, and we, we've had the good fortune to see many of our participants reunited with families, reunited with children, and have those, uh, those re relationships rehabilitated. That's a big deal. It's that, a beautiful thing. It's really it's, something. It's very beautiful. I know that during my addiction, me and my father, we didn't really see eye to eye. You know, he didn't really have much to do to, with me, you know, because I was manipulating, you know, it's all that. Yeah. But um, now I have to say, you know, once I went to jail and I came out, he's, he's been my rock. And uh, I have a great relationship with him. That's wonderful. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Absolutely. Many people have different opinions and answers to this question. So, I have to ask you, do you believe in the term, addiction is a disease? I've, <clears throat> as you know, as a judge, I uh, am called upon to not only interact uh, in, the, in the context of the recovery court dockets and interact with people who uh, have criminal cases or are involved in the justice system, uh, but I also have training. I also have continuing legal education, and that's a, a yearly uh, obligation. There's, there's a significant amount of time that I spend, and every judge spends, uh, in fact, every lawyer spends uh, learning uh, about uh, new developments in the law. But I also have the opportunity uh, to learn about addiction. And I can tell you, I'm not a person who's not uh, uh, a doctor who reads x-rays or CT scans or MRIs, but we did have the opportunity to literally view uh, MRI results of folks who are in the midst of active addiction and the same person once their addiction is um, 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 in recovery status and persons who are not addicted. And you can literally see on MRIs, you can literally see damage to a human being's brain that's attributable to all kinds of drugs. And it is actually a disease state. Um, and uh, drugs create a profound physiological change that's observable. But also, um, you know, you don't have to have an actual diagnostic tool and a, and a bona fide medical doctor uh, uh, who's been through all that training to uh, tell you what you can observe. And if you have opportunity to interact with folks who are in the midst of addiction, I, I think that what you find is a kind of, uh, kind of co-occurring problem or, or things that exist at the same time, two things that exist at the same time. Folks who are in the midst of active addiction um, have a disease that has profoundly affected the, the system of uh, uh, painful responses, pleasurable responses, and it, and it screws that all up or messes that all up uh, for a human being. And that's the disease process. Uh, because that becomes such a powerful motivator, sometimes uh, fo folks will make immoral choices uh, to obtain the drug that, that suits them the best or, or whatever. And sometimes they'll make uh, unfortunate choices that are illegal uh, and those are, are moral decisions that a human being is responsible for. But addiction in and for itself uh, is, I believe it's a disease process. I think that's something that's verifiable, that, that uh, is um, supportable uh, through the current uh, uh, knowledge that we have, current uh, uh, scientific evidence. and. and uh, that's what makes it so uh, insidious, what makes it so difficult, what makes it so hard to, you know, uh, I hate referring to this, but it, it, folks who are in the midst of active addiction cannot just say no on their own uh, uh, force of their will. Uh, it, it really takes a community. It really takes a uh, Education, it takes uh, the support of other folks who have been successful. It takes the support of uh, 
uh, institutions like Recovery Court to help make positive change. So um, I, I think uh, I think there's a lot of facets to it, but we can we can certainly verify and show that disease is uh, a better model to explain it than some sort of moral failing. Okay, very well put. Well, I want to thank you again so much for giving me the time to do this interview. It's my pleasure. It's so good to see you again. It's so good to see you too, and I will see you at the next milestone. I'm looking forward to that. Yes, I am too. All it's right. going to be summertime, hot dogs, hamburgers, cornhole. It's going to be great. Again, my name is Della. This is Progress Not Perfection, and I am here with Judge Cerny. And this interview is adjourned. <laughs>